So this is part one of probably a two-parter. Uh, should grace believers support non-grace ministries? We're in Titus chapter one, and uh, in a moment we'll be looking at some verses there. Um, <clears throat> this uh, comes as a, a result of a, a couple things. One, a situation with uh, my mom uh, at home. Uh, you know, we have been um, uh, more or less trying to get her to to move here and to um, uh, come to our church so that she can learn grace doctrine. And uh, in some ways I can understand because she has lived in that area all of her life, uh, born, raised there, and is still uh, there. And all of the family is, is buried there. And that's, uh, that's well and good, and I certainly can understand roots. However, uh, there are no doctrinal churches uh, uh, in the area. At least um, uh, she doesn't want to put forth the effort at this time to begin the process of trying to look. Uh, and um, uh, there are definitely no grace churches in the area. Uh, none uh, that we could recommend. And so she's going to this one church. It's a church where I was saved. And they do have a straight gospel. However, uh, the whole organization is now moving toward the, the, um, the Willow Creek Saddleback experience of contemporary music where you have praise worship, uh, you know, and, um, and virtually nothing, not even the gospel anymore. It's just you have this gathering and, and it's a social time. And uh, the, the guy that they got in there, the, the guy that led me to Christ was an old time gospel preacher. But uh, they don't want they don't want that anymore. Out with that uh, old time business in with the new. Uh, and so uh, my mom does play the organ there. And the, the guy uh, had asked her to um, to play some of these praise courses so in the first place. She, she doesn't want to do it. Uh, and uh, and uh, in the second place, um, she also helps like with uh, things like the communion. And the guy, I forget what it was, but it was something like um, uh, root beer and, and uh, rye bread that he wanted to serve for the elements. And my mom said, I'm not going to do it. She said, fire me. I don't care. I'm not going to do it. Uh, and he said, well, Betty, what's the matter? You know, don't you want to be hip and up with things? And she said, no. Uh, and uh, at that point is when I would have said, look, we, we don't agree on some things, and I'm going to have to find me another church. But anyway, <clears throat> she's still, she's still um, uh, staying there. Now, the, the, the thing about that is she, is, she goes faithfully, uh, she gives her money, and she's using her talents to support a ministry and a thrust that she disagrees with. You know, uh, she goes there, but she hates it when she goes, and uh, she would not invite anybody else there because she doesn't believe what the guy's teaching. So there is a dilemma. Uh, and I said, Mom, you know, you've got to do something. And uh, to me, roots are important uh, and so forth, but time is wasting, and you're, you're going, you're just spinning your wheels, going through the motions and the like. And when you get to the Bema seat, Jesus Christ is not going to ask you about your roots. Jesus Christ is going to ask you about the doctrine that you learn and the ministries that you support. Now, <clears throat> then we also, uh, from time to time, have questions on, uh, you know, what do you think about this one and that one? And, and, so, uh, and uh, I'm going to give some principles here to help us out. If they are non-grace, the rule is... No, generally not. We should not support them. Uh, now, that doesn't mean, and here's the exception, that you cannot from time to time listen. It just depends on how close or how far away uh, they are from accurate teaching. Uh, uh, because you are lending your support to some things that uh, are going to cause you and others uh, trouble. Maybe not right at this minute, but down the line they will. And, um, and perhaps you've not realized just how much trouble that these things can cause you, but they can. So the rule is uh, generally, no, we should not. There are enough grace ministries that are screaming for help, for support, and, and, and the like. Uh, to, for us as grace believers to continue to, to, uh, um, support these other ministries in, uh, in ways by way of attendance and, and uh, listening and, and monetary support. However, there are some um, 
areas wherein we can support other people. Now, here's why. Now, this is one of those one hand and other hand. Here is the balance. First of all, in Titus chapter 1, verse number 4, we all have a common faith. Now, I limit that to the gospel when I say a common faith. Verse number 4, Titus, my own son, after the common faith. Now, the reason that I limit that to the gospel is because that's about all we agree on. <laughs> Uh, if you uh, go from that point onward with regard to um, other doctrines, who was the apostle for this dispensation? Peter or Paul? Well, we would disagree because if you go to an Acts 2 church or somebody with an Acts 2 position, they believe that Peter has as much clout and, and as much to say for us in this dispensation as Paul. When you go to commissions, is it the Great Commission or Grace Commission? We disagree when it comes to speaking in tongues. Do you or don't you? Uh, where the church starts, Acts 2, Acts 9, or Acts 13, and, and, and so forth. And on and on we can go with, yes, we all have a common faith in Christ, but we depart therefrom. In the areas where we depart, we cannot support, at least to not, not wholeheartedly. Now, the word here for common is koinos, and it means in the Greek, belonging equally or shared jointly by two or more. It's something that belongs to the community as a whole. Now, what is the word <clears throat> that is the uh, word we always use here with, relay, uh, with the, um, regard to the uh, Greek of the New Testament? Koinos is this word, common, belonging to the community as, the whole, uh, as a whole, or koine. Now, koine Greek is, is really important. Uh, and the reason being, Alexander the Great was a conqueror. And he would go to this conquer, uh, country and he would, you know, whip them, uh, bring them in line, and then he'd go to the next country. And the thing is, he would cons conscript the men into his army so that he would have more men to defeat the, the next country. And so he would uh, say, 10, up, forward, ho! And he realized he had a problem. All the men that were Greek understood what he said. All the men of these other countries, <laughs> you know, which way do you want me to turn? What do you want me to do? So this guy, being the genius that he was, had a Koine Greek. And the koine belonged to the community of every single culture and country where he went. So that everybody spoke the same language, and as they say today, it's well worn, they were on the same page. They knew what they were saying. Now, that united cultures and countries and, and even the finances and the monetary systems of his empire, they were all united with this one thing, uh, and that was the koine Greek. So this word koinos is important because Jesus Christ belongs to us equally. And I don't care what else they believe, we must support someone else who has trusted Jesus Christ as their Savior. We have a common faith, belongs to them, belongs to us, uh, and we definitely need to respect that. So here's Grace believer, uh, one over here, and I just, I didn't have time to illustrate this. I was going to, I was going to speak on something else because we still are behind in some of our studies, but I thought, no, too much of a coincidence here. I'm going to go ahead and do it. So here's grace believer two, and right in the middle, now I've got to watch my friend, the microphone here. I have slapped him from the right and slapped him from the left. I've come down on him with the karate chop and he's still been my faithful friend. But uh, so, uh, but I'm going to watch doing this. Believer one, believer two. One is a grace believer and one has been saved by grace and that's it. One is a grace believer, meaning he follows Paul uh, and uh, what he says for the Gentiles. The other has been saved by Paul's gospel, though he doesn't realize that it is Paul's gospel exclusively and not Peter's and, and the like. Uh, but he's still saved. We have a common faith. So each looks toward Jesus Christ uh, and we share him in common. Though we don't share much else in common, we at least share Jesus Christ. Now come back with me to the book of Romans, chapter 1.
and Book of Romans, chapter 1. And now, <laughs> how did I do this? I cannot find uh, the place that I want. You're going to have to help me. How in the world I did this? Uh, and again, I kicked myself. It's, called, it's mutual is the word that I'm looking at. I was so careful to copy these reference verses down. That's what I didn't do. Verse number 12, I have Romans 1, 2 here, and I didn't put the one in front of the two. Okay. The second reason, and I do apologize for that, uh, that uh, we uh, can have for supporting some aspects of non-grace ministries is that not only do we have a common faith but we have a mutual faith and that's what it says here that is that i might be comforted together with you by the mutual faith both of you and me now the common faith is koinos meaning something shared equally by those of the believing community if you're saved uh, in this dispensation you're only saved by one gospel and that's paul's gospel uh, you might not have understood all of the ramifications of a prophecy, mystery, Paul and Peter, kingdom and, 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 uh, and the body and, and so forth. But if you are saved, you're saved by Paul's gospel because God is not inconsistent. He cannot save you by any other gospel than the one that is revealed for that dispensation. If he does, then God's a hypocrite and we can't trust him. So therefore, if you're saved, it must be by the gospel pertinent for that age. That's what dispensational truth's all about. And that's the stand we, we take here. Why do we get so upset about other religions and not supporting them and fighting them tooth and toenail? Why? Because, because they're teaching a gospel that damns the souls of men. People become secure in their message. They're going to stand before Jesus Christ at the great white throne and be cast into hell. Why? Because they believe the wrong thing. The message for this age is grace. And it's Paul's message, and it's the only one that saves. So if it's faith plus something else, faith plus your works, faith plus baptism, faith plus confirmation, faith plus the church membership, faith plus, uh, then, or if, if it's a religious faith that, uh, that leaves Christ out of the picture, you are not saved. So that's the common faith we share with these other people. Here, mutual. Alelon is the Greek. It means having the same relationship or respect to each other. So now, here is, the direction changes just a bit. The grace believer one and grace believer two look towards something in the center and say, this, this is what we share in common, Christ's grace message for today. But now, Grace believer one and two with a mutual faith look past the gospel to each other. And now we share something mutually. What is that? An experience. You know what you did when you got saved? Same thing I did. You used your volition to believe on Jesus Christ. And you know what I have to do? Same thing you have to do to me. You have to respect that. If you trust to Christ as your Savior and, and He is in your heart because of that decision you made, I have to respect that. I believe that you're saved. And you've got to do the very same thing to me. I trusted Christ. You know, yeah, no hiding my candle under a bushel. I'll tell you exactly what I did. And if you did the very same thing, then you are saved. And we've enjoyed that uh, experience mutually. And so we look to one another as saved people and we have a relationship. Uh, whether you want it or not, there is a relationship there. And there should be mutual respect based on that decision that you made. Now, there are a lot of other things that we share in common because of this mutual faith. Turn with me to chapter 5 in Romans. Chapter 5. And verse number 5. So when I look at another believer, despite the fact that he doesn't believe anything else like I do except the one thing, that it's only Christ that saves, 
I still have to look at him with a measure of respect because once he trusted Christ, we share in common the same experience. And some other things, verse 5. We're going to key in on the word us. Hope makes not ashamed because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. Guess what that other person has? Guess who he has living in him? Uh, uh, he might have go through the rigmarole of all the other uh, isms or what have you. But if he's truly trusted Jesus Christ, he has God, the Holy Spirit within. That makes him a vessel that is very important. And we just can't simply, uh, you know, begin the process of running them down randomly. Uh, because in him is the most precious a person, of course, next to the Lord Jesus Christ and God the Father, that the universe holds in store. It's God the Holy Spirit. And that the moment of his salvation, when he believed, there was another thing that we experienced. And that is the Holy Spirit was granted to both of us. We need to respect that. Um, despite the fact that we disagree in other areas, there is an area of agreement. You have the Spirit living within and of course, if you go to 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 1, and verse number 14, there's a, a second thing with regard to the Holy Spirit. That good thing which was committed to you, uh, that's the gospel, this dispensation, mystery truth, Keep by the Holy Ghost and note, which dwells in us. He not only is given to all of us equally, but the word dwell there means to take up residence. Guess what? You are not alone in this world if you are a believer. Uh, you have a constant companion now that you, you cannot get out of you. He is there forever. Now, whether you allow him his full power and influence in your life, that's another question. That's spirit filling. But in dwelling came the minute you got saved. And so here's grace one and grace two. And they're looking at one another with this mutual faith. And I see one who has believed like me. We share that in common. And one who now has been given God, the Holy Spirit. As a matter of fact, turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Second Corinthians chapter five. This is important to recognize that despite the fact that they they now baptize and they have the great commission and that they take all of the Bible and they mix it all together and they don't understand these things. If they're truly saved, guess what? They're going up in the rapture. <laughs> guess what? Uh, they're going to be there when we're there. They're not going to have as many rewards. That's, that's true. However, if they're truly saved, we're all going to go up together because the Holy Spirit's been given to us. He indwells us and he is called the earnest of our salvation or verse five. He that wrought us for the self, the same thing is God who has given unto us the earnest of his spirit. When the spirit came in our hearts, we now have a witness. Now the, the word here, uh, earnest, means uh, an earnest promise, a down payment with promise to pay uh, the full amount. And that is the resurrection of our bodies and the delivering of us uh, to uh, Jesus Christ in uh, the, uh, the uh, second heavens or in the heavens. So you want to know the Holy Spirit's name? His name is Ernest. Ernest Holy Spirit. That's his name. Because when he lives in there, and that's what's going to happen. Uh, we're going to be brought up to the, to the beam of seat. Why should you be here? I mean, uh, who is going to witness to the fact? God, the Holy Spirit says, look, I've been living with this guy all these years. and know him inside and out. And uh, though we've had our struggles, Galatians chapter 5, the flesh and the spirit. Now, though we've had our struggles, there's one thing he did, and that's trust Christ. And I am the earnest of his salvation and his redemption. I have to testify he really did it been living there all this time. So when I then see another a believer, even though it's not a grace believer, I look and see something that I share mutually with him. All right. Uh, let's, um, let's go uh, back. Well, here we're in second. Uh, uh, oh, we're in uh, second Corinthians. Let's go back to um, 
the book of Ephesians. Back to the book of Ephesians. And again, we're keying on the word us. And the reason that I say us is simply because it doesn't matter who they are or where they go to church or what they believe subsequent to their salvation. If they're truly saved, the us, uh, they belong to the us, the, the group that are members of uh, the body of Christ. Okay, verse number three, Ephesians 1. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us. Now, that person, even though we disagree with them doctrinally beyond that point, that person has still been blessed of God. Uh, that person is still going to be in the heavenlies as a member of the body of Christ. Yes, he is going to take care of the stables in the back. Uh, yes, he is going to live in, in a shack back there and probably not have indoor plumbing. I do not know. But, uh, but uh, you know, he's not going to be the higher echelon of the body of Christ in the hierarchy of, of the thrones and dominions and powers. No, he probably won't have all the wealth and the riches. But will he still be there? Yes. Will he still be recognized as the Christ by, by the entire creation? Absolutely. And that is because God has blessed us. Not just, not just certain of us, but us collectively. Anybody who has trusted Christ. All right. Verse 4. According as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. So that's the second thing. Because they're, they are members of the body of Christ, God has blessed them as believers in this age. And the next thing he has done, has, he has chosen them. And despite the fact that their doctrine is different after their salvation, still does not negate this choice. God said anybody between Paul and the rapture who believes, regardless of what they do and believe after the fact, I have not only blessed them, but I have chosen them to enjoy those blessings in heavenly places. Uh, and so nobody is going to be torn from the, the body of Christ. Uh, um, the, at uh, the rapture, it is indeed a rapture of the total of body. It is not a rupture. Uh, you know, 99% of the body is going up and the other is going to be left. No, everybody say mutually is going to enjoy this blessed hope. Note verse 5 having predestined us unto the adoption of children. Now, predestination is not predestination to be saved. That's what other churches teach, and they are wrong to the core. And we don't, should not support them. That's, that's the whole thing. However, this predestination, we can understand. What is that? We're predestined to the adoption. And the adoption means the displaying of sonship. So once we're in the body of Christ, back here God made a choice to display the body of Christ as a, as a grand and, and glorious gem of His grace. That's what our, our study on the prehistoric um, creature on eternal display is about, and we will finish that. And that is simply that God made a choice to display the body of Christ before the foundation of the world. And if you are saved, you're going to be part of that process and that event. All right, let's go to the book of Galatians chapter 3 for one last thing here. Book of Galatians chapter 3 and verse number 26. The common faith... It all belongs equally to us. It unites us as the Koine Greek united the empire of Alexander the Great. Everybody was one in that em empire, though they were racially different, um, though they were governmentally different, uh, their location was different, their culture was different, their society was different, and yet they were all one. How did they do it? They had something in common, their, their language. But now we're talking about a mutual faith that shows respect each to the other because of an experience and a, and a common decision. Now note what it does. Verse 26, you are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Despite our differences in other areas, we still must recognize the fact that they're part of the family. Yes, 
they are black sheep. <laughs> yes, uh, yes, uh, they, uh, they need to be uh, trained a little differently. However, they cannot ever be excommunicated from the family. They can ne never be disowned if they're truly saved. All right, let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Now I would remind you we're looking at two hands here. On the one hand and on, on the tother. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 13. Here's something else that we share in common that we must mutually respect. It says, we having the same spirit of faith. According as it is written, I believed and therefore I have spoken. Note this. We also believe and therefore speak. It doesn't matter what doctrinal uh, uh, statement that church holds. If they're truly saved, uh, they've, got to, they've got this want to, to tell somebody else. And that's what this basically is. It's a spree de corps, something in common. Um, and if you've ever been in a place where somebody has just gotten saved, uh, most usually they want to tell somebody else. I know I did. I don't know what your experience uh, has been. But the word pneuma there, uh, we would call it spree de corps. Esprit de corps is where? Here's your drill sergeant, and here you have all of these various people uh, from the United States of America, and you come to, say, Paris Island, you're a Marine drill sergeant, and all these people, some of them, some are real tough guys. Others have been pampered and baby by their mother. Others weren't want to write their congressman. Other, you know, uh, and you've got all of these people. Now, what do you have to do? All these different ideas, different agendas, you have to give them spree de corps. If you're ever going to win a war, the only way you can do it is to have your army or your unit have spree de corps. What is that? Have something in common, an enthusiasm for one objective, and that is beating the enemy. So you look out for the back of the other guy, realizing that's in your best interest, and that you all give 100% toward the goal of what? Beating the enemy. That's spree de corps. Uh, that's having the same spirit of faith. Keep the faith, brother. What? Well, all together, we're going to beat that enemy. Individually, we're not going to do it. They're going to, to beat us. And so that's what this is. We have a common faith. We have a mutual faith. And we now have a common goal and enthusiasm to reach that goal. And that's what it says here. We also believe, he uses the, um, the collective pronoun here. We all who have trusted Christ. And therefore, we speak. We, th we've got this common goal. What is that? To tell others about the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, to, uh, to give them the same opportunity of winning uh, or, or of uh, being one to Christ and the blessings of the body. All right, let's go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Now, I like this one because I went back in my childhood for an illustration here. Uh, I could have gone back in my childhood uh, for an illustration of Coach Hank. I had um, several coaches in, in my time. The best was my high school coach because he knew how to give esprit de corps better than anybody else I, that I've ever known. Uh, and let me tell you, you talk about a ragtag bunch uh, of guys. We were, but we always had winning teams. And the reason that we did was because he took the, the best and the worst and he brought us together and gave us spree de corps. And we always were, uh, you know, we had um, uh, eight and two season, nine and one season with the, the ten, uh, 10 regular games we had in uh, the Mon Valley Conference there. And, and he could do this. None of the other coaches did. Once we got to college, uh, just seemed that everybody was on their own and, and the like. It's just different. But in high school, he, he brought us together. Uh, but uh, I, I talked the last time about uh, Dr. Wilt in, in my football experience, the high school football experience. I thought maybe, maybe I shouldn't do that. You know, he's the guy that gave atomic bomb for everything. Got a headache, take a teaspoon of this atomic bomb. It was sad. <laughs> Got an eye ache, you know, whatever it was, he gave this and it was a cure-all for everything. I used to wonder about his credentials and how safe I was uh, in his hands. 
Uh, anyway, for as the body is one, says verse 12, and has many members, all the members of the one body being many are one body. So another person who has trusted Christ, they're a member of that body. And for by one spirit, we're all baptized into that one body. Verse 14, for the body is not one member, but many. And so therefore, as members of the body of Christ, we need to respect them. We can have uh, a fellowship limited to that basis. And on this uh, common objective, if they're getting people saved, of course, on the basis of evangelism, I believe, therefore I speak. We believe, therefore we speak. There's a, there's a common goal here to get others uh, to numerically fulfill the body of Christ. Now, they share that in common with us because if numerically the body of Christ is not fulfilled, who wins, you say, the angelic conflict? Uh, there are two, three, five, ten thrones up there that are, that are not accounted for. And they have the same obligation to get people in the body as we do. And they should have the same interest. Therefore, we share this spree de corps, a common objective. Get them in the body. Sure. Uh, it's not by hook or by crook, though, but get them in the body. That's our common objective. But now, once they're in the body, <clears throat> note what it says. Uh, the foot shall not say, because I'm not the hand, I'm not of the body. You, you just simply can't say that. Uh, is it therefore not of the body? Well, of course not. It still is. Ear say, I'm not the eye. Is it not of the body? And, and so forth. Uh, so we come on down to uh, verse number 27. Now ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. Melos is the Greek. And it's a distinct part or component of the whole without which it would not be characteristically or functionally the same. So if you're, you're talking about something that is, that is uh, necessary to make it one thing that is characteristically or functionally the same. If they're in the body and then all of a sudden they're out of the body, the characteristic of the body is not the same. The function of the body is, is not the same uh, and, and so forth. Now, I went back to thinking, what in the world could I use to illustrate this? And for some reason, it's a food illustration, wouldn't you know it? But it's when my grandmother used to make rhubarb pie. Now, I liked rhubarb pie as a kid. I don't particularly like it anymore. I don't know why. But uh, back there, I remember tasting rhubarb pie without the sugar. Now, some of you may like it. I don't know. But uh, let me tell you, it was not characteristically the same. <laughs> it was not functionally the same. When my grandmother would put, and I would watch her, to put those cups of sugar in that, uh, that mixture, hey, it came out okay, I could eat it. But if she left it out, and I tasted it, oh my word, you know, uh, some people can do it, but I sure couldn't, I had to have it sweetened. So, so it's one, one component. Everything else was the same, but it was just one thing that was not part of the overall mixture. And you know what? I couldn't eat it. It was not characteristically the same. Now, that's a very um, uh, uh, exact principle we're talking about here. If they've trusted Christ and they are part of the body, then their um, being part makes, the, makes it a component which characterizes the body in a unique way that we cannot say, well, now, you're not part of the body. You, you got baptized after you got saved uh, as a so-called testimony in your spirituality, but you're, therefore you're not part of the body. Uh -uh. They're still part of the body. And we would not want them to be any different. Why? Because you'd look at the body of Christ and it wouldn't be the same. It couldn't function the same as, the, as if an eye were put out. What would the ear do and, and the like? It affects the function of the body. All the parts are needed and necessary for life and, and so forth. So uh, we believe in uh, supporting those who are saved and respecting them as members of the body. Let's note uh, one more thing here uh, while we're here, and we still have a few minutes. Verse 25. That there should be no, now this can be pronounced schism or schism either way. The reason I know that way, way back yonder, uh, I had guys who had come from the hills of Tennessee that uh, 
would say, well, that if a preacher would preach in, in a homiletics class. Uh, and we all we all slaughtered the King's English back in those days. And they'd say schism. And the guy said, well, that, that guy doesn't even know that schism and the like. Well, it's both. It's like paradigm, paradigm. It's both. Or as Stan said one time, paradigm. Well, I don't know about that. You have to see the spelling. That there should be no schism, schism in the body. Now, this, uh, this uh, simply means um, a separation. You know, do you have, have uh, your, your uh, hand? There's a, here's an illustration for you, just came to me. Just a few days back, there was a guy who got caught under a truck, and it was his hand. And he, I mean, he was stuck there, and he was stuck there for a couple of days, evidently. And the only way he was going to save his life was to do what with that hand? He was going to cut it off. And this is a true story. Just, just have, he, he was out in the wilderness evidently and that truck was on him. He just could not get free from that in any way, shape or form. Don't ask me how. But, and so he therefore was going to amputate the hand. Well, you, you talk about something's not characteristically the same. Something's not functionally the same. He cuts his hand off. <clears throat> and so that's what it says here. But that the members should have the same care one of another. Mariam Nao. It means to seek to promote their best spiritual interests. Now, with this, we're going to uh, begin turning here in just a little bit on this particular principle. If they're members of the body and they do not want us to have doctrinal truth, are they acting in our best spiritual interest? There it is. They're beginning to break some, some uh, rules and regulations regarding the body. That's why we promote grace, truths, and doctrines. That is the only way possible that we can act in their best spiritual interest. Uh, and so though we recognize them as part of the body, we've got to, if one cell of the body begins to turn cancerous, is it promoting the best spiritual interest of the cell next to it or of all the cells in the body? And uh, of course, uh, the, the uh, answer is no. It is not promoting the general health and welfare and well-being of the body if it's turning sour on us, if it's becoming a free radical, if it's becoming cancerous, if it's going to affect the life and health of that body. And that's what false doctrine does. Yes, they're still part of the body. They're, they're, the cells are together. But if one cell begins acting in its own interest rather than that of the whole body, and uh, that is where we begin to disagree. Hey, wait, what, you have to say, wait one second. Yes, that's true. You're part of the body and I respect you for it. And everything we share in common, uh, I rejoice. However, there are other aspects to the health of the body we must realize here. And that all members, as the, the verse says here, should have the same care. And the word means to act in its ba uh, best spiritual interest. And if they're not getting the truth subsequent to their salvation, it's not acting in their best spiritual interest. So let's move on here. We just have a few minutes and we'll begin uh, at this point in the next hour. 2 Corinthians, chapter 3. 2 Corinthians, chapter 3. Now, if they are true believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, they not only share a common membership, but they also share a common ministry. Right, here's areas of... Um, uh, of doctrine that we have not developed fully as yet, that we will in the future. Uh, but it has to do with the New Testament or the New Covenant. Both the Old Covenant and the New Covenant were given to Israel. But the New Covenant basically is a spiritual covenant with eternal blessings based on the blood of Jesus Christ. That's why he said uh, in the upper room there, this is the cup of new, the new covenant in my blood. Take this. This is my body. And he established the Lord's table based on the new covenant to Israel. However, we get those benefits by grace. But that's why Paul tells us here in verse number six, we all share something in common. Who God has made us 
able ministers of the new covenant. Hikanao is the word able there, and it means to be equipped with adequate powers to perform one's duty. And uh, the word uh, um, uh, minister there is uh, diakonos. Now, we have... We have belabored the point on two words, doulos and diakonos. Both mean to be waiters on table tables, uh, but uh, if you are a diakonos, oh, it's the word deacon here, you have a choice as to whether or not you want to. If you are a doulos or a servant, especially a bond servant, you give up your right, you forfeit your right to say no. But the word here is diakonos. Which means we can or we can't. But it's in all of our interest, whether you're uh, in whatever church, if you're saved, it's in all of our interest to be able ministers of the New Testament. The blood of the new covenant by grace is the blood that saves us today. And it's the only thing that saves. And so they have that responsibility. We have that responsibility. And in fact, based on this, we come back to chapter five here is where we'll start next time, based on this ability to be a New Testament deacon, minister, a waiter on a table, meaning the unsaved world doesn't have salvation and we bring the blood of the Lamb to them for salvation. It's part of our ambassadorship. Just a, just a chapter over, he talks about us, verse number 20, being ambassadors for Christ. And part of the ambassadorship is based on the fact that we're able ministers of the new covenant. And uh, no matter who you are, if you're saved and alive at this time in history, you are a New Testament minister and an ambassador for Christ. And we'll get into that here in just a little bit.